I'm Dave W. Palmer and today I'm giving you part three of the prophetic word God has given me. This morning when I woke up, God was downloading to me for about an hour in the early times of this morning and I've been furiously making notes and getting myself ready. But this, I believe, is a word from God and it's very, very important for us at this time. We've already been through the Passover season and the next great intersection, of course, is the season of Pentecost. Numbers 9, 1, 13, 2-3 NLT A year after Israel's departure from Egypt, the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. In the first month of that year he said, Send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the twelve ancestral tribes. 3. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He sent out twelve men, all tribal leaders of Israel, from their camp in the wilderness of Paran. Was the time the children of Israel came to the brink of the Jordan for the first time. Of course, they didn't enter at that time, but I believe that this time round, God is saying, come on, I want you to enter your promised land. I want you to go in and take hold of all the promises I've given for a great end time harvest, for a glorious church, for a move of God, for a mighty awakening in the world around us, and God is saying that now, while we have the opportunity, He's locked us down. He said, come into the house, close the door, come into the secret place with me, and it's time to change. When Noah went into the ark, the world was one way, and he went into lockdown with his family, but when he came out, the world was never the same again. And the same could be said about the disciples of Jesus. When they went into the upper room, their world was in devastation. But when they came out of their lockdown, the, everything changed from that day forward. And I believe that this can be your reality too. As you look to Jesus, as you draw close to Him, and invest this time wisely. You know, the Bible says in Romans 8.28 that all things work together for good. Or a more accurate translation would say, And we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love Him, who are called according to His purposes. God doesn't shake everything to hurt his children. God is shaking it to shake for a lot of reasons to affect the world and to draw people out of the world and help them realize that there's a much better way. He's not doing it to hurt his children. If you have been born again and you've given your life to Jesus and confessed him as Lord, and if you want to follow him as your good shepherd, the shaking is not to hurt you. As a matter of fact, it's a time for God's supernatural provision to go into the house, to lock down with your family, and to invest it with God. And the shaking that's happening, I want to read a reasonably long piece of scripture from Hebrews that talks about this because what it says is so, so important for our time. And this is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 to 29. And it says straight away, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. To put this in context, I want to take us through the book of Hebrews in a couple of seconds to put it in context. Hebrews starts like this. God, who at sundry times in a diverse manner spoke in time past under the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. To summarize that, God is speaking to us by Jesus. And when you get into Hebrews chapter 2, it says, See that you don't let these things slip, because if anybody under the Old Testament failed to obey the word they heard, they suffered punishment. You know, of how much worse punishment is available to those who ignore Jesus and don't follow him. Then the book of Hebrews goes into chapter 3 and 4, where three times it says the same Old Testament verse. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Amen? Like they did in the rebellion. For the example, he gives the illustration of the children of Israel six weeks after the initial Passover on the brink of the promised land didn't go in because of unbelief. And he's telling us today, don't be like them. Do not harden your heart. You are hearing his voice. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 29, my, or verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. 
It's a promise. It's his ability to speak to you, not your ability to hear him. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. The follow, that's our responsibility, is to hear and follow. And then when you follow through in the book of Hebrews, in, in those two chapters, three times, today if you'll hear his voice, harden not your heart. And then we get here, it says, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose listen to it, whose voice then shook the earth, but now has he promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This is very exciting. It's God's voice that shakes. God's voice shakes. Psalm 29 says, The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. And you know, what's so exciting about this is that the Word of God the living Word of God is Jesus. Jesus is the Word made flesh. And the Bible says this about the Word of God. In John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. So the Word of God created everything. We saw that again in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. And it says about the Son, that by Him the Father created everything. Then it goes on to say that He's the express image of His person, and He's the image of God, but that He upholds all things by the Word of His power. So the Word of God is not only instrumental in creation and creating the entire physical and spiritual universe, but the Word of God upholds all things. Interesting, because when Jesus speaks, and when He speaks loudly, the Bible says, out of Zion, the Lord will roar. Amen? The Lord roars out of Zion. And I want to encourage you today with this idea. If God is upholding all things with the word of his power, every time he speaks, all things vibrate. Now, I'm a musician <laughs> and I'm a bass player, so I love vibrating music. And I tell you now, when we've played outside and we've made it as loud as we could, I have felt the ground shake from sound. Now, now that's just an illustration. All sound is vibrations in the air. I've done a bit of physics in my day, but that's just a picture of what happens in the spirit realm. And so when we as a people all start to hear the word of God and we start to speak on his behalf and we start to come into unison and all say the same thing, Jesus' voice starts to speak with great authority, with great power, and it starts to shake everything. Amen. I'll read it again. It says whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal. So God's objective in shaking by his voice is to remove things. What's he going to remove? Well, let me tell you a story or two. When I was a new Christian, I remember God spoke to me clearly one day and he said, Dave, Whatever is in your life that is not got by the Word of God, founded on the Word of God, obtained by obedience and faith in the Word of God, will be lost. You will lose it anyway. Why? Because it's subject to shaking. Only things that are built on the Word of God, that come by receiving through faith in the Word of God, that are done in obedience to the voice of God, are the things that will survive the shaking. And didn't Jesus say when he was teaching, he said, those that hear my words and do them, then he gives an illustration, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. In other words, he put the foundation on the rock and then the wind came, the storms came, the floods came and his house didn't fall. And Jesus is telling us the only sure foundation that can survive the storms of life, that can survive the enemy attacks, that can give us a foothold to withstand from 
and the one that can sh stand the shaking is that which is built on obedience to the Word of God. So when God says He shakes everything to remove something, He's trying to remove from our lives the things that are, are of no eternal benefit, things that are built on the world system, things that are not built on God's eternal Word. That's what He's saying to us. And it goes on to say that things which cannot be shaken may remain. Remember Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace. There's a lot more to be said about that. But I will say this, Romans 4.16, it is of faith that it might be by grace. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Not just only by hearing the Bible, but by hearing God speak to you. Faith comes in your heart when you hear God speak to you. Amen. Either faith comes or Jesus is a liar. And Jesus is not a liar. The book of Romans is true. Faith will come when you hear from God. That's why he said it again. See that you refuse not him who speaks. You need the word of God. You need the faith that it generates. You need the mountain moving power of God's living word coming from your lips. Jesus said, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak and bring forth good things. So we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. So let's have grace. You won't have grace unless you've got faith because it is of faith that it might be by grace. And then he says, by which we may serve, by grace. When you get that grace, you can serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. In the context and in the whole book of Hebrews, he has to be talking about the living Word of God. Burns things up. Jeremiah said, the Word of God is like a fire shut up in my bones. So I want to encourage you today. This is your season for locking in, hearing from God, being in the Word. And I say it all the time. Eat the Word. Drink the Word. The Word, you know, is spiritual food. It's spiritual drink. I say sleep the Word so you can listen to it at night time. You can play the Bible through your phone. You can have preachers on as you're falling to sleep. There's lots of way that you can get the Word. Amen. But the more you have the Word in you, the more the Word will drive at everything that's not of God. And then you'll survive the shaking. What's God's objective in the shaking? He wants to get everything not built on the Word of God out and he wants the word in and he wants us to draw close to God, to draw close to Jesus. Remember, those that survive the shaking also fulfill the condition of Psalm 91, which says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It's our only guarantee of safety. Even Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jesus, the good shepherd, said, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. We've got to hear and obey. Today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Amen. Now, I want to give an illustration of this. At the Last Supper, John sat next to Jesus. And the Bible records that he reclined on Jesus and he was leaning on his chest. In other words, the other disciples were near Jesus. They were drawing close, but only one of them got so close that he had his ear next to Jesus' heartbeat. That's the secret place. If you draw that close to Jesus, you'll not only pick up his voice, you'll hear even his quietest words. You'll discern his breathing and the moving of the wind of his spirit and you'll be able to feel his very heartbeat so that you'll know not only what he says, but the feeling that's behind it, his motivation, his heart that's behind it. Today, I want to encourage you to draw that close. And remember, even Peter, another very famous disciple, when it really came to finding out what was going to happen in the future, he had to ask the disciple that was so close to Jesus that he was leaning on his chest. 
Leaning on him, of course, means putting your faith in him, but it means drawing so close, dwelling in that secret place. You'll be able to hear things from God that nobody else can hear. This is your destiny for right now.